Order members. The next item in the order paper is a motion promoting gender sensitive uh, assembly. I ask the clerk to read, read the motion. <coughs> that this assembly on International Women's Day notes recommendation 12 of the Assembly and Executive Review Committee report entitled Women in Politics in the Northern Ireland Assembly, which proposed that the Assembly should consider adopting measures to create a gender sensitive assembly and endorses the recommendations in the Gender Sensitive Assembly Action Plan as put forward by the Northern Ireland Assembly Women's Caucus. I call Claire Bailey to move the motion. I beg to move, Speaker. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposal of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and a further 10 minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. And I invite you to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, and happy International Women's Day to everyone in the Chamber. First time it's ever been predominantly female uh, in the Chamber, <laughs> so that's good to see. <laughs> Thanks Trevor and Mike as well, yes you get a special mention. <laughs> but, Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to move this motion as the current Chair of the Northern Ireland Assembly's Women's Caucus. Um, and members will be aware that of the Women in Politics 2015 report, which sets out to analyse the key challenges and barriers facing women when entering politics in Northern Ireland and into this Assembly. It also made recommendations to enhance the role of women already active in the political arena. One of those recommendations was the creation of the Women's Caucus. Another was the establishment of a gender-sensitive Northern Ireland Assembly. We have come a long way with representation of women in political life in Northern Ireland, but we have not come far enough. The Good Friday Belfast Agreement committed to increasing women's participation, but women remain underrepresented. Time and time again, Northern Ireland has been called out for this. The Assembly's own Executive Review Committee report on women in politics said this is a serious matter to be addressed urgently. But where is that urgency? Only 35% of our MLAs are women. It is time to get a little bit more urgent. To say this is overdue would be a gross understatement, structurally and institutionally. Our narrative in Northern Ireland for the past 20 or so years has been underpinned by parity of esteem, but this has not been extended to all people that this assembly aims to represent. Where is the parity of esteem for women? Where is the parity of, of esteem for those with multi-sectionalities? Representation is not true nor effective unless there is adequate representation for all the people that we are here to legislate for. There is no shortage of potential leadership outside this chamber, and it is up to this assembly to endorse actions to counter the marginalization that stops those potential leaders from stepping forward. It is up to us. The Women's Caucus see this as imperative, but we cannot affect this change unless we are supported by this Assembly. We know that women's meaningful participation in politics helps advance gender equality for society as a whole. We know it affects both the scope of policy issues that are debated for legislation, for the types of solutions that are brought forward, and we know it allows for greater responsiveness to people's needs. And we also know it increases cooperation among political parties towards a more sustainable future. We know having more women in positions of leadership and decision-making will reflect the lived reality of women's lives and will directly influence legislation and policy-making so that they actually meet the needs of women. Our own Women's Caucus is an example of that. Today, we bring forward this motion united across party lines. The potential here is transformative for this Assembly and for Northern Ireland. The engagement of women is crucial, but women are not a homogenous group. Women lead intersectional lives with different lived experiences that inform different priorities and needs. Political representation must reflect that. A gender-blind our gender neutral approach does not work because society is not gender blind nor is it gender neutral. 
systemic, institutional and structural inequalities have seen to that. We know the barriers. They are very well understood by most, and they permeate across all sectors of women's lives. Many women have overcome these obstacles, and this should be recognised and celebrated. But that's not enough. The playing field needs to be levelled for all women. Equal access to opportunities needs to be universal. This equality needs to be substantive. Every woman MLA does an exceptional job because they carry extra burdens. 35% representation is where we are, and 50% is where we need to be. A gender-sensitive approach is paramount if we are to meaningfully achieve this. The aims of the Women's Caucus are set at that. At 35%, we are on the way out of marginalisation, but considerable steps need to be taken to get this assembly to where it needs to be. Only as the number of women MLAs increase will we be able to work more effectively together to promote substantive, gender-sensitive institutional change. And to do that is crucial, and that everyone is brought along on that journey. The root causes of marginalisation within the political sphere are well known, both universally and specifically here in Northern Ireland. Everyone must be involved in the solution to this problem. We must shift the focus of responsibility for advancing gender equality away from women MLAs and onto this assembly as a whole. To all of its members, to its institutional culture, its processes and its mechanisms. Our Gender Sensitive Assembly Action Plan looks at the assembly carefully. It acknowledges the unseen but undeniable felt barriers that deter the presence of women and limit their participation and their retention, and brings forward strong, actionable solutions. A gender sensitive assembly is one that meets the requirements of all people within its structures, one that does not enforce direct or indirect discriminatory practices, one that is family friendly, one where women and men's needs to live and work are enabled, and one where sexist language and behaviour is not tolerated. This directly results in legislation and, and legislation making processes that are gender sensitive and more effective. It results in parliaments that deliver better to con constituents. It results in parliaments that fulfil their democratic mandate and in parliaments which are more legitimate overall. All member states of the Interparliamentary Union, of which the UK is one, adopted a plan of action for gender sensitive parliaments in 2012. Westminster have taken significant steps to work toward this, but our devolved assembly is lagging far behind. The Women's Caucus Action Plan lays out a clear guide for how we can fulfil our end of the bargain. This is so that we can improve the overall quality and legitimacy of this institution, so that we can be recognised on the world stage as an example of best practice. This is an unparalleled opportunity to be outward looking rather than insular, to keep pace with international st standards, so that we do not continue to procrastinate, to stagnate or to roll back on our hard won gains around gender equality. This gender sensitive assembly action plan addresses how to do this by setting out priorities and strategy, well-targeted interventions which are both achievable and essential. It focuses on the needs and interests of current and future women MLAs around the assembly structures, operations and methods, and it aims to address the problems of discrimination and recrimination. It focuses on processes that facilitate participation for everyone like a formal mechanism to enable the Women's Caucus to bring forward issues of concern and reviewing the Assembly's voting mechanisms. It focuses on actions that promote equality and participation, like initiatives related to encouraging women to enter politics and targeted engagement with the media. It focuses on an environment that is accessible to both women and men, where there is zero tolerance for discriminatory and sexist language 
and where all MLAs are encouraged to engage in the gender mainstreaming processes. And it focuses on gender sensitive political parties and politicians, an essential element to drive forward this change. The Women's Caucus want to encourage women into politics, to support them once they are elected, to enable them to remain in those positions and to champion their progression. The Assembly's own Executive Review Committee recommended these measures, so now we bring them forward in this action plan as a roadmap for how to implement them. We recognise the problem and we present here an effective, robust and sustainable solution. So I call on this Assembly to endorse the action plan so that we may finally take these steps to create a gender sensitive Assembly. I commend this motion to the House. But Mr Speaker, I would also like to add a very short contribution of my own in my capacity as an MLA and Green Party member. And I want to give thanks to the previous chairs, some of whom are in the chamber today, um, but particularly to Katrina Ryan, who, when I was first elected in 2016, was the chair of the caucus and um, came and gave me a special invite to join the caucus, because at that time the rules of the caucus didn't allow me to be an automatic member. And there's so much that I would like to say today on International Women's Day to mark the achievements and hard-won rights of women, um, but also to acknowledge the long road that lies ahead. But in my last few seconds, I would like to pay tribute to the women from the Northwest Migrants Forum with the launch of their new project and finding not just their voice, but their power of themselves in challenging the barriers and institutions that keep them marginalized and pledge to do all I can to support them and look forward to seeing some of them elected in this chamber. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on uh, Paula Bradley and all members have up to five minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And it just reminded me there at the end of the, the chair of the caucus's speech when Mitchell McLaughlin was in the chair at one of our International Women's Days, um, where I was speaking and went well over time. And when I sat down, he said, I dare, don't have interrupted you there. So I, I absolutely get that. And I thank, uh, I thank you on Claire's behalf for allowing her to do that. Um, can I also Mitchell join... was always a soft touch. You know me. <laughs> can I also join Claire in wishing everyone in this House and in this chamber today a very happy International Women's Day? And can I begin then by thanking all of those wonderful women who have supported me and given me the strength through this, this journey, which at times has been horrendous and at other times has been an absolutely wonderful experience. So can I just say a big thank you to all of them. I also want to thank all of those many women who over this last year during COVID have stepped up to the mark, have been at the, the front and centre of their community, front and centre of our health service, and front and centre of our retail service as well. So a big thank you to them. Mr Speaker, when I was looking through the, the pack prepared for us today, I read through some of the various speeches and it was extremely thought provoking to see the names of so many strong women that have stood up in this chamber in my time that I have been here in the last 10 years to deliver speeches on International Day. We had Karen McDevitt, Megan Fearon, Joanne Dobson, Sandra Overend, and of course, I have to mention the great defender of rights for women, Katrina Oran, and someone who I'm proud to say by the end of, my, of that term was also a very good friend of mine. I have very fond memories of the ball, and reading their contributions, it took me back to that period of 2015 when I sat on the AR ARC committee, or AER committee, and I know that Trevor sat on that committee also, and, and Pat too. And it was, a really, it was a really motivational time. It was a time of hope. It was a time that we felt that we were going to bring about great change. And we have brought about change. This is a very different chamber now to the chamber that I remember back in 2011, whenever I first came here. There's a different dynamic in this chamber. No more do we ever hear heckling in this chamber when a woman gets up, and gets up to speak. And that is something I experienced when I first came here. And I have to say, by the end of that 2015 mandate, every one of the members that sat on this bench knew that that was not acceptable, because I didn't accept it, and I didn't like it, and I didn't want it. And I didn't want to see any female in this chamber um, being treated in that way. Of course, as I said, we do have hope, and there has been many good things, but as the Chair of the Caucus has said, we have so, so much more to do. And I know we had the three years where we didn't have the Assembly, and we've been in the middle of a COVID pandemic for the last year, but I am so glad to see this come back on the agenda in this, in, in this chamber again, and look at what change we can affect 
to encourage those many women. Um, those many women that are going to come, some of you will be here for many more years after I'm long gone, and there's a whole new generation of women that should feel part of politics in Northern Ireland. So I absolutely support that. There are various issues, and the Chair touched on some of them, that, that prohibit women entering into politics. And I have to say, any given day you ask me, would you recommend being an elected member? It changes, it fluctuates. Someday I say, absolutely, it's, it's the, one of the, the, the greatest things you could do. And other days I will say, stay away from it. It is awful, it is toxic, it is horrible. But that's not within here, that's outside. And I think that uh, I read in a, a, one of our, uh, the briefing paper, or maybe somewhere else, about the Beltel report. I know I certainly took part in it, where a quarter of female MLAs were sexually harassed and three quarters experienced sexism, and that was on social media, and that influence that that has on our lives. And it does have, it has a deep influence on our lives and how we behave, and that shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't have to face that uh, as women who are, who are elected and who are standing up for what they believe in. They shouldn't have to face that ter tyranny of abuse. I also was heartened to see the Westminster report around um, pregnancy. I think it was with ministers. I think that's something we need to look at here, definitely in the Assembly going forward, especially for all you wonderful young women out there, not so much myself, um, but when it comes to pregnancy and it comes to proxy voting and it comes to um, uh, leave um, to, to um, have your children. I remember the time here with Michelle Gildernew and, of course, then with Nicola Mallon as well, and just the, the, what they had to face in those first few months of having a baby. So I think that is something that we need to take forward positively out of this debate today, that we need to look at that. And we also need to look at paternal leave. I mean, the gender sensitive parliament is not just about women. It's about equality across the board for women and men. Um, can I just, in finishing, I just want to say a, a big thank you to Mike Nesbitt and to Trevor Lund. Trevor Lund has been a great supporter of this issue for, from our time way back in AERC all those years ago, and also to Mike Nesbitt, who is my Vice Chair on UNSCR 1325 APG, and has shown real commitment to affecting change in women's lives as well. And to all those many men out there who are our supporters, who are feminists in their own right, can I say a big thank you, and we need more of you. We need you to step up to the mark, and we need you to actually put it out there on the record that you support women. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Emma Sheeran. Corlea, uh, that's not, not anything difficult to follow there at all. Thanks, Paula. I'm delighted to support this motion as a member of the Women's Caucus and also in my capacity as Sinn Féin's Equality Spokesperson. The theme of this year's International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge, and I think the creation of a gender-sensitive assembly is key in challenging many of the obstacles that women and girls across the North face on a daily basis. And this just isn't about having diversity for the sake of it. It's not about gesture politics, which only ever have a place, in my opinion, when they're backed up by action. If you can't see, you can't be, but more importantly, you'll not be thought about. For women across the globe, it takes an average time of between 8 and 10 years to get a diagnosis of endometriosis or PCOS, both of which have chronic pain as a symptom and require surgery to manage. If no one around the table has ever asked their doctor about their PMS, or had to explain to a teacher that they couldn't do PE that day, or realised that they came to work without period products and stood in a public toilet for 10 minutes with the sweat lashing off them, trying to make a pound coin fit into a slot that was made for a 50 pence piece, how can we ever expect to improve services for menstrual health? If knowledge and learning on these topics aren't improved and GPs are still going to prescribe the contraceptive pill to 13-year-olds with extreme PMS instead of trying to identify what the cause is and treating them accordingly, how can anyone be expected to know what's healthy and what isn't? Research tells us that women have been disproportionately impacted by crises such as austerity, Brexit and COVID-19, with the latter, and Paula alluded to this as well, the most recent of the three really exposing some deficits in our public services. We know that the unpaid care economy is dominated by women and that it's to women that the majority of domestic and caring duties within the home falls. Additionally, research tells us that the majority of public sector workers are women and women are more likely to have been laid off or furloughed during COVID-19. When we look at this through an intersectional lens, we can see that women who also qualify within minority groupings have been impacted even harder, again alluded to by the Chair Claire. 63% of disabled women have struggled to access basic necessities during lockdown. 43% of BAME women believe that they would be in more debt after this crisis compared to 37% of white women. Leaving the EU is likely to result in a rollback of workers' rights, including parental leave, equal treatment and rights for part-time workers, on which women rely. 
These are many examples of how gender equality can be mainstreamed within policy. My party colleague, Minister Deirdre Hargey, has just published her expert advisory panel report on the gender equality strategy, which includes a commitment to implement an international human rights legislation to tackle gender neutrality in policy making. In terms of the aims of this motion and encouraging more women to get involved in public life, there are a number of practical steps that we should consider. I know that in my own experience as a rural female representative, I have received support and help from both men and women within our party, and obviously Sinn Féin have more female MLAs than other at the minute. One of the key policies that we have adopted internally is the use of gender quotas for, for elections, something that means our councillors, TDs, MLAs, Shanadori and MP are representative of our membership. The mainstreaming of affirmative action really does lead to positive results. Mandatory childcare for politicians is one of the key tenets of a gender-sensitive parliament. Recognising that parenting whilst in public office is incredibly difficult and demanding, and that this is something that disproportionately impacts upon women. CEDAW's concluding observations in 2019 noted that the committee remained concerned about the lack of uniform protection of women and girls from all forms of gender-based violence across the jurisdiction of the state party, noting with particular concern the inadequacy of laws and policies to protect women. This Assembly should implement a violence against women and girls strategy to tackle gender-based violence, particularly as much of this originates in misogyny and sexist prejudices. The same discriminatory pre prejudices often manifest themselves in the form of online abuse from keyboard warriors and negative comments about our appearances that we as women have to contend with every time we put ourselves out there. This motion calls for the implementation of the UNSCR 1325, which identified intimidation by paramilitary groups as an obstacle to female participation in public life, and we've seen in recent weeks how this uh, does not have to be exaggerated. To be a politician is a public servant and a community activist, and I know that I got involved in politics because of my desire for a better and fairer Ireland, and as such, my feminism is interlinked with my republicanism. Improving our assembly to encourage more female participation can only be a positive thing for us all. And thank you all. Thank you, and I call Shania Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and happy International Women's Day to everybody here. Um, I also want to take a chance to thank um, St Mary's High School in Uri, who I had the privilege of joining this morning to celebrate International Women's Day with, and that was a, a very enjoyable experience. And I know many of us were recalling at the start of um, this debate how this time last year this Assembly Chamber was filled with young women who were uh, shall I say, very enthusiastic and very inspiring. And it is noted today their absence. I think those people being around us and those young women um, definitely added to, to this place and no doubt will in the years ahead. And I think it's particularly during these COVID times, um, it's events like that, that that do put a little bit of a dampener on, on what it is we're trying to achieve. But that said, I, I think it is very timely that we bring forward this motion. And I want to thank the officials um, who are predominantly women on the, on the caucus and the clerks who, who assist and support us um, in, in putting forward the, the proposals that are here today. The action plan is not just about getting women into politics, and I think in a way we started to become good at that. I think we have tried to understand the barriers and open the doors. And perhaps what we're less good at, or there is room for improvement um, on, is retaining women in politics. Because I think once women arrive into the political forum, um, it, it may be that they're at an age and a time in their life where their choices are their own and they're easier made. But once responsibility, caring responsibilities become part of their life, there, there definitely is a, a different um, playing field. And I think, you know, uh, Ms. Bradley referred to the list of names there. And I think of a number of women who have come through this house and have left perhaps too early. And that wasn't always due to the, the uh, expression of the electorate. It may be that just the facilities and the, the opportunities in politics isn't always there. So I do think we do need to get better and improve on opening the door to women in political life. This place does stand as an example to other places and uh, workplaces on how we manage women in the workplace and offer facilities to them. And there was rightly a reference to childcare 
uh, not just in public life, but in all walks of life. Childcare can be an absolute barrier to employment. It can be the deal breaker that doesn't make it worth your while going out to work because you're surrendering so much and there's little in the way of any financial reward or career prospects beyond it. And that's not good enough. Women should have that choice and it should be based on, on what they choose and want to do. I also uh, want to give thanks to my colleague and friend Pat Catney, who I know is doing a lot of work on the period poverty pace. And it, it is an individuals going off and taking up the mantra and the task of doing small pieces, all these little pieces of the jigsaw add up to making just life a better place for women. And in the theme of Choose to Challenge, um, which is the, the theme for this year's International Women's Day, I have chosen to challenge the, the lack of understanding that exists for women around the issue of the menopause. I think it's still quite taboo in a lot of circles. It isn't openly talked about. It's not a comfortable conversation, and a lot of people just find it easier to park it. And I don't think we should, because here is, uh, we have a parliament buildings, we have an example that we can set to all. Some of the solutions to assisting a woman through the menopause are not rocket science. It's about allowing simple things of making sure that the, there is an air conditioning or a window nearby, that there is an understanding that there's fresh, cool drinking water, that a woman leaving a meeting may not be an insult, it might be for a few moments. There are simple, simple things, and I understand, I understand that for a lot of women, thankfully, they go through menopause without any great um, effect, but for some it can be quite problematic. And some of the, um, I suppose, the, the, the jokes and jibes can be quite hurtful that are associated with menopause and have been um, brushed aside as light-hearted banter, and they're not at times. It can be a time in a woman's life where it could be a knock to her confidence. And it's on other women to build that woman up, not knock her down. And I think we all in here um, need to, I suppose, be strong in our vocal um, support of those women, but also supporting not just the women and men who are line managers who are charged with supporting those women. We need to understand that they're comfortable Let's open up the conversation, make the language one that everybody's comfortable with, and that we reach a time where it becomes a policy like all others, where we just understand it's about making life better for women in their career or their workplace. And on that uh, note, I will end it, Mr Speaker, and I want to again thank and wish everybody a ha happy International Women's Day. And I'm, going to, I'm going to draw my fire on Meg Nesbitt, so remember five minutes to speak. Meg Nesbitt. I will not dare go one millisecond over my time, Mr Speaker. Uh, I rise on behalf of my party to uh, support this motion, um, to thank the movers of the motion, or the city sponsors of the motion, and to wish everybody a happy International uh, Women's, Women's Day. I speak partly as Vice Chair of the All Party Group on UNSCR 1325, Women, Peace and Security. And, and I thank the Chair for, for her kind words. Behind the catchy title of that APG, there's great work going on. I think of the Northern Ireland Women's European Platform, Yona Monaghan and Liz Law, uh, who do great work with us. I think also of Rachel Powell of the Women's Policy Group, who has brought forward the COVID-19 uh, Feminist Recovery Plan, focusing on the gender pay gap uh, and also on the disproportionate impact of the COVID pandemic on women uh, in our society. Uh, I also speak uh, with a little bit of international experience. I have been to Africa twice uh, as a, an associate trainer with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. I have been in Sudan and Ethiopia uh, working with aspiring female politicians. And it seems to me there is a commonality in what is holding them back uh, that holds back people coming into this chamber. It is largely a fear of the unknown. Uh, it is some extent a fear of misogyny of bullying and intimidation by men, and also a fear of the impact on their work-life balance, and practical things like the absence of a crash uh, and working late nights when there are late night debates uh, are all factors that need to be considered. Uh, I have to, at this point, uh, address the imbalance within the MLA group of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, we don't even get over 
uh, 30%, as you will all know. And it is one of my, my deepest regrets on the day I gave up the leadership of the party, the day of the results of the 2017 election, uh, that we were saying goodbye to Joanne Dobson uh, and to Sandra Overend. Uh, and Sandra was the person who did most to encourage female membership uh, of the Ulster Unionist Party at that time and encouraged females to think about standing for election. And it was through a program called the Dame Gera Parker program, and I'm sure some of you will know. I will give way, yes. Mrs. Dobson, very well. Um, there was an allegation that had the constituency been properly divided evenly, Mrs. Dobson, Mrs. Dobson would have had a, a reasonably even pool of votes to canvas. And as a result of the uh, configuration of the constituency, she feels that she wasn't given a fair crack of the whip. Hardly an indication of promoting one of the, the best women we've ever had in this building. The member has an action minute. Uh, I acknowledge the member's intervention. Uh, I'm not sure how relevant it is to this debate, but I will say this to the member. In 2017, Ms Dobson had a larger share of the constituency than she had in 2016. Larger, more votes, first preference votes to go for. She got elected in 2016. The fact she didn't get elected in 2017 does not reflect that she had votes taken away from her. She had a larger share of the constituency. Dame Parker, as I say, was the first to be uh, elected in 1921. Uh, and she also had the distinction of becoming the first female uh, to hold a cabinet position when she was made Minister for Health and Local Government uh, in 1949. I now want to pay tribute to three councillor colleagues who have given a kind of modern twist to the Parker programme. Three councillors from Amma, Van Bridge uh, and Craig Avon Council, Julie Flaherty, Louise McKinstry uh, and Jill McCauley, who have run a social media campaign called We Need You Girl. Uh, and last week, uh, they had a major Zoom conference uh, with a significant number of females engaging and expressing an interest in finding out more about becoming uh, an elected representative. I found during my five years as leader of this party that when I was trying to encourage people in, uh, that the easiest thing to do was to just identify who I wanted. You know, people like Steve Aitken and Doug Beattie. Uh, and to go and speak to them directly and encourage them. I have to say, when I went to potentially female candidates, not one of them came back positively. It might be because of me, but I wonder to what extent it's about the reputation and how they feel about this house. Because some really capable females said, when they'd thought about it, and they didn't think about it that long, they did not want to do it. And I think we all need to reflect uh, on that. Briefly, if I may go on a tangent, but a slightly important one, another person I brought in, co-opted, was Andy Allen. And I think we should focus on the fact that in terms of representation, we need to be more representative of people with disabilities. When Andy first came here, he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't vote without somebody helping him because there are steps and there wasn't an appropriate ramp. Uh, in the division lobby. Uh, so I would love to see us thinking about these issues as well. The final thought, Mr. Speaker, is the COVID feminist recovery plan. Uh, it was mid-November when I mentioned this House, the plan to the First and the Deputy First Minister. Uh, I'm still awaiting the response. Uh, I hope it is a positive one, because that would be a, a fitting mark for this International Women's Day. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, and happy International Women's Day. Um, and Mr Speaker, thank you for allowing this debate to take place today. Um, today's debate has been co-signed by all parties and the independent member, and the motion calls on the Northern Ireland Assembly to adopt measures to create a gender-sensitive assembly. As the former Deputy Chair and current Alliance Party representative on the Women's Caucus, I'm very proud to hold that position. And I fully support our call for the Assembly to take forward a, a gender-sensitive action plan. I hope this time it will finally be heard. AERC committee report, as has been mentioned by others, in their report entitled Women in Politics in the Northern Ireland Assembly, which was published on the 17th of February 2015, 
confirmed that the committee recommended that the Assembly should establish a working group on gender-sensitive parliament. The working group should have equal membership of male and female MLAs. That group didn't happen, but it doesn't mean it still couldn't. In 2016, this Assembly acknowledged the work of the then Speaker's Reference Group. I was actually part of that group, not as an MLA. I hadn't been elected at that stage, but I came along here on a voluntary basis to the basement, to the visitors' cafe, and then there was other rooms. Uh, we discussed ways forward. I know at that time there was a discussion that having quotas could improve the gender balance in this place. Getting there. But here we are still in 2021 asking for a gender sensitive parliament to be introduced. The Women's Caucus, in having its first ever debate today, used the mechanism of cross party signatures to get the motion on the agenda. I hope in future the Women's Caucus could be recognised for its work and be enabled to bring forward motions in its own right, as has been mentioned by our chair, rather than having to adapt procedures to help us have our voices heard. As the Women's Caucus um, request states, a gender sensitive parliament is one that responds to the needs and interests of both men and women in its structures, operations, methods and its work. A gender sensitive parliament is founded on the principle of gender equality, that is both men and women have equal right to participate on its structures and processes without discrimination and recrimination. A gender equality policy provides direction for the setting of priorities and strategic, well-targeted interventions to achieve them. And there are three elements that are essential to us achieving a gender-sensitive parliament, and that is that it's an envir environment that's accessible, to, accessible sorry, to both men and women, processes that facilitate the protection of both women and men, and actions that promote equality and participation. As others have stated, there are specific actions that will enable this Assembly to take forward the elements, but we need to create the environment that recognises that this Assembly is comprised of people elected to serve everyone in Northern Ireland and to find ways to enable that to happen. For example, why don't we take the opportunity now to update standing orders to enable proxy voting outside of COVID arrangements to allow members to have maternity, paternity and adoption leave, or even sick leave? That would help to encourage younger women and men to be politicians. Why is it that my colleague Judith Cochran was the only female MLA to have ever had a private member's bill reach royal assent? Why is it the case, and why doesn't the House do something to talk to all the women MLAs and say, what's stopping you? What's the barrier? Not just at the moment. Eileen Bell was our only female speaker. There's an opportunity. You'll have your moment in a moment, Mr. Wells. Thank you. Um, in this place, we use words like madam and mister. Why don't we just use the terms that people are given, the jobs that they have? As our report calls for, there needs to be an audit of language in this place to make sure that it's inclusive. The House may congratulate itself on the provision of free sanitary wear, but it does ignore menopause. And I have to welcome the member from the SDLP bringing that forward. There are some of us who struggle in this place with the heat blown out of those fans or the freezing cold air. It's not easy. But I have to say, the problem isn't in this room. It's getting to it. Social media, aggression, violence, attacks on offices, and how the media treat us has a lot to do with that. At a previous International Women's Day, there was a female participation event, lots of young women here. That night on the media, the one man in the room appeared on the television. They ignored all of the rest, see they're not, all of the rest of us who had did, done interviews, they ignored us completely. What I would like to say, just finally, is I would like to thank Mr. Wales. I'll give way. Record. There was a, an, a, an accuracy there. Patricia Loosley, the SDLP MLA for Lagan Valley, way back 20 years ago, successfully promoted and got through a private member's bill in this house. Thank you. I'll maybe have to update, thank you. I'll maybe have to update the Bills Office who provided me with the information, but there we go. Finally, I'd just like to say I would like to thank the women, the grandmothers, the mummies, some of us don't have them anymore, on whose shoulders I stand. And to all those girls, including my daughter, who I embarrassed in this chamber, and all those young women who are looking for inspiration. I'd like to thank them for their time, and I'd like to thank every one of you.
We may all come from different political places, but together we as women respect each other in this place. We work together and we are trying our best for everyone across Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Pass you in. I want to thank the, the Women's Caucus for bringing this very important motion uh, forward on this La Edernation de Naman, uh, International uh, Women's Day. And, uh, I mean, you just have to take a, lo a look around at the membership of this assembly, and it's still badly underrepresented. Uh, and the issue of female underrepresentation can't be seen in isolation uh, from the way society in general is organised and the gender inequality that exists in day-to-day -day life for women. Even today, a report in the media suggests that, on average, a young woman starting out on her working life today will end up with £100,000 less than a man in her pension pot when she reaches retirement age. And that's not right. And it's just one small example of how women are disadvantaged in our society, but there are many, many more. And we in this assembly have a responsibility to try and ensure that gender equality is a priority. It rests with us as political leaders to set an example. And while there have been improvements uh, uh, they're, they're in here over the years, there's still a long, long way to go before we have a genuinely fair and gender-sensitive institution here. There are, of course, many barriers that must be overcome before we reach that holy grail, not least the fact that this institution is not family-friendly. Uh, and I'm constantly amazed at the ability of my female colleagues, and not just in my own party, but right across the parties, to carry out their role as elected representatives. Uh, that includes late-night sit-ins, uh, meetings in the evenings after we finish here. I mean, this is no nine to five job with 37 and a half hours a week. And we're constantly on call, and there's no doubt that it impinges on and intrudes in family life. However, we on our own here are not going to resolve what is a deep rooted societal problem of inequality. Uh, the education uh, education clearly has a role to play in encouraging girls to pursue what could be seen as non-traditional subjects such as science, technology, engineering and maths. There should also be mandatory subjects in schools relating to gender relations and the empowerment of girls and women. And the issue of childcare, as has been highlighted here today, is an obstacle for many women. Data from NISRA shows that the most common reason for economic inactivity among men has been identified as sickness or disability. For women, however, the most common reason is unpaid current responsibilities. And it is a fact that it is women in the main who take on current responsibilities, and especially for children. And how can we attract women into politics if we don't make the effort to provide childcare? This Assembly needs to set an example by establishing childcare facilities for members. Another area where women suffer more than men in politics is in terms of harassment and abuse, both within politics and on social media. And I note the comments from Paula uh, earlier on when she uh, pointed out that uh, the hackling that used to be common in this chamber uh, has ended. I remember the Women's Coalition in particular complaining about uh, male members mooing when they got up to speak. And I'm glad to say that that is a, is a thing of the past. But there have also been many instances of misogynistic, hate-filled, sexist abuse towards female politicians from all parties uh, on social media. And there needs to be greater deterrence to end this type of behaviour. Uh, there also needs to be awareness training to get women into politics. And assembly staff also need training so that they can anticipate policies or procedures that may have an adverse impact on women fulfilling their role as elected representatives, representatives on an equal footing with their male college, colleagues. And just to conclude, uh, uh, can I just 
send my uh, solidarity to all female colleagues from all parties on this International Women's Day. Thank you. And I call Gemma Dolan. And happy International Women's Day to everybody. Um, women should be respected and appreciated every day, but their impact and contribution to our lives should be particularly celebrated today. Uh, I want to commend the Women's Caucus staff for keeping us in check and for putting this motion together today. It is internationally recognised that society's needs are better served where there is a diverse political representation. And whilst the recent increases in the 2016 and 2017 Assembly elections is welcome, Women are still underrepresented within this assembly at only 33%, despite constituting 53% of the population. This is the lowest female representation when compared with other devolved legislatures. The North of Ireland also has the lowest percentage of female councillors, with only 26%. Currently in the Dáil, general election guidelines require candidate quotas of 30% women. The introduction of gender quotas before the 2016 general election to the Dáil increased the proportion of female candidates by 6.5 per cent. In Sinn Féin, we have been working to increase our female representation and are an example of the benefit of this as our Assembly team now has more female MLAs than males and our two party leaders are women. A political career path is deemed as being not family friendly due to long plenary settings and the varying demands placed on members' time. It remains true that women are the main carers in our society. And as such, we need to explore strategies to improve the work-life balance and consider childcare issues and other caring responsibilities that have already been touched on today. If we are serious about getting more young women into political life here, we need to make some serious but very doable changes. As far as I am aware, and I stand to be corrected, the Permanent Secretary of the Department for Finance was looking into allocating space on the estate for a childcare centre and or family room for MLAs and Assembly staff to avail of which will be a positive step and something that I think should be pursued. The low percentage of women in elected roles here is a microcosm of underrepresentation of women in sectors across society. NISRA statistics show that in 2020 women constituted 79% of those in part-time employment in the North, and a third of working age women are economically inactive. This com compares unfavourably with the wider average across these islands, where women constitute 74% of part-time employees and 25.6 of those deemed economically inactive. Structural inequality disadvantages women through the pers persistence of the gender pay gap in the North. Research by ARC and Ulster University shows that the gross median weekly female earnings are £127 less per week than men's. All employers must work to end the gender pay gap in order to advance, advance women's rights and workers' rights. In Britain, Gender disaggregated data shows how many women are claiming universal credit and how many redundancies have been females. This is crucial data needed here to determine the extent of gender inequality. But our NISR data is not disaggregated by gender. Publishing gender disaggregated data is one of many measures which can be taken by the Assembly to make the labour market more equal. Women are more likely to be engaged in informal, temporary or precarious forms of employment, including employment with zero-hour contracts. To tackle this, I am taking forward a bill that will end zero-hour contracts and replace them with banded hour contracts. This will provide stable employment for women. Many women in poverty in the North are also working women. This is connected to reduced working hours for women. Women are more likely to work part-time and struggle to increase their hours of work due to caring responsibilities. Caring for young children limits both the number of hours a person can work and the distance they can travel for work. This leaves many women locked in poverty, especially when jobs are low paid. The campaign theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge, and therefore we should be challenging ourselves to implement the necessary changes it takes to become a gender sensitive assembly and a gender sensitive society. Thank you. And I call Carol Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and happy International Women's Day, everyone. This is my first um, in the Assembly, so I'm delighted um, to speak today. Um, so historically, we know uh, women in Northern Ireland have played a huge role in paving the path to peace. And if we look at our history, we draw inspiration from the likes of uh, Breach Rogers, uh, Mo Mullen, Monica McWilliams, and so many more. Uh, if we shine a light on today, the SDLP wholeheartedly support this motion uh, on creating a gender-sensitive assembly, and I'd like to thank Claire and other members involved for bringing this forward. 
Uh, it's fantastic to see more women involved in politics, but it's eye-opening also uh, at the realities of just how far we have left to go. Uh, I continue to be inspired when I see women across all political affiliations leading from the front. Uh, looking at other parties, it's evident, despite our political differences, uh, many across this House are undeniably passionate and wholeheartedly devoted to the betterment uh, of their community, so I respect you all for that. Um, whether it's council, MLA or MP, especially in grassroots activism, it's most welcome to see um, you know, so many women being, becoming politically involved. And I also welcome uh, Queen's University Student Union is now an all-female lineup. Um, so a very capable bunch indeed, and I wholeheartedly welcome this. Uh, with female politicians, I still think there are many evident barriers, but also there are many that are not so visible. They happen behind closed doors, and oftentimes, sadly, when not challenged, can happen in council chambers. Uh, the dismissive attitudes, the overlooking of intellect, not attributing ideas to the woman who created them, the you're new here, watch how we've always done it. However, now I am an optimist when it comes to change. I believe we are in a real uh, transitional and transformative uh, part of our history here. Women are single-handedly challenging the more traditional ideas of what a decision maker, a policy maker and a peace builder really looks like. I think at my age too, it's been a very interesting uh, experience and I think other female MLAs uh, and councillors around my age would probably agree at the best of times it's not uh, always easy or straightforward um, and the path isn't really carved out just yet. Um, but there's often an assumption that uh, young people in politics lack you know, life experience to lead, and I think that that's not true. Um, I have often found as well, if you're not seen as tenacious uh, and dogmatic in your approach, you're doing it wrong, uh, and to almost fulfill the job role, you have to be uh, inherently more masculine, so that's just something I've noted. But my vision for the future is that within our political structures here in Northern Ireland, we ha that we start to see more diverse uh, representatives reflective of our, our changing populations here and our changing demographics uh, in our society. And I must say, on the topic of making the Assembly more inclusive, we must urgently address protocol around shame for women in political roles and public life taking maternity leave. Uh, I know representatives in the South as well have also voiced their concern around this. Uh, and it shouldn't be something that is negotiated. Maternity leave is a fundamental right uh, for women. And I know our SDLP Minister Nicola Mallon uh, and Claire Hanna have raised this uh, and seek change on this matter. But looking to our past at our political landscape, you know, women have had to fight really just to be at the table uh, and they have done incredible work, especially looking at the women's coalition in the 1990s, really inspiring. Um, and seeing women coming together to rise above the kind of religious, sectarian uh, and tensions around that time to do best by their families and their communities. Uh, and I know being a member of the ceasefire generation, I, I feel a sense of obligation to maintain the peace and stability that women then uh, fought so hard for and continue to do so as we've seen in this chamber. But more women in politics is a very positive thing and we've seen in Scotland, for example, around the free uh, provision of period products in uh, 2019 and I'm inspired by the work of my colleague Pat Catney uh, in seeking to eradicate period poverty. Um, it's a subject we all know is traditionally taboo, but uh, I love that it's being brought forward um, by a man with two daughters um, who speaks so without shame uh, on the matter. Um, but to conclude, Mr Speaker, there are many challenges left um, to be addressed, and it's important that we all keep the doors open uh, and we don't pull the ladder up behind us to encourage more women uh, of all ages and backgrounds to become uh, involved in politics. Female leaders shouldn't be limited or defined by what they wear, or what they look like, if they choose to have children or not. And I think women collectively coming together, having discussions like we have today, politicians, activists on the ground, to those working in the community and voluntary sector, speaking up on the barriers and the sexism, uh, and we should continue to challenge the current barriers uh, and strive for change. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Women's Caucus for bringing forward this motion, and especially today on International Women's Day. It's timely and significant that we should be debating this. The motion talks of the Assembly adopting measures to create a gender-sensitive Assembly, and I totally agree. We want to put a question to you all listening um, here today. What national parliaments across the world have the highest percentage of women elected? Just think about it, and I'll tell you at the end, and no cheating, don't be looking up on Google. I'll give you a clue. The UK ranks 39th. So 
We only have to look around the Assembly to see the imbalance that we have in terms of women's representation as MLAs, the 32 of us, and indeed this is a similar position in Westminster with around 33 per cent and also at our local council level. And we'll have to ask ourselves why that is and what are we going to do about it? What are the barriers to women becoming elected here? Could it be the toxic masculinity of some areas of politics and the constant misogyny? Is it acceptable for female politicians to be told that they, as the only woman in the pre in, present in a room full of men, are there to make up the gender balance or there just to make the cups of tea? Of course not. It's totally wrong and things need to change. Paul has already mentioned this, but I was one of the female MLAs that was recently interviewed by Suzanne Breen about our experiences as female politicians, and we all must have said similar things. 70% of us have had sexist remarks made to their face by men, and three quarters have experienced sexism on social media. And there are vile comments that are made about women in the political arena, especially in party leadership, what they wear, what shoes they are wearing, what they look like their hair, their makeup, their personal life and their relationship status, why they're not married, why they don't have children, what age they are, that has to stop. Personal attacks, abuse and harassment disproportionately affect women in public life and not enough is being done to give a positive platform and credit to women that lead in our society and this is why debates and days like this are so important. But just to touch on what's already been mentioned, where is our childcare strategy? Juggling the demands of work and family is so difficult and renders many women unable to seek meaningful employment and too often is the only option available is poorly paid or a zero hour contract. Having to spend the little money that they have on childcare pushes women back into a vicious cycle of struggling to balance work and looking after family. And it is women that bore and still do bear the brunt of so-called welfare reform. And it is women who are disproportionately affected by climate breakdown. And it is women who are there to pick up the pieces to ensure not only women are represented in standing for as representatives, but in position of leadership, as well, to, as, well as looking at other groups that are traditionally sidelined. Like Mike, like as Mike has mentioned, those who are disabled, but those women who identify as LGBTQ+, and the BME women, where are they? How do we get to 50-50 representation? And these are all questions that political parties and government departments must address sooner rather than later. But Mr Speaker, to a wider point, there is a worrying trend in many policies to neutralise gender and the realities of what we actually live in. And if this trend continues, it will be to our detriment. If we fail to recognise the gendered nature of specific societal issues, then we will fail to deal with them. It is my firm belief that the blind pursuit of policies that neutralise gendered issues is a failure of government. Gender is not neutral. Societal problems like domestic abuse and sexual violence are gendered issues, and if we fail to recognise this in government, then we fail to effectively tackle such issues, and we cannot bury our heads in the sand. Much more work needs to be done to recognise the unique circumstances and experience of women in the criminal justice system, for instance, the prison system. That was built by men for men. It is recognised. And we need, to, uh, we need to look at those who find themselves homeless, say, as a result of being trafficked, exploited and abused. So, Mr Speaker, to finish, as I could go on all day, and to give an answer to the question I posed at the start, the national parliaments with the highest percentage of females elected are Rwanda, Cuba and UAE. I thank the members of the caucus for bringing forward this motion, and I choose to challenge each and every one of us in the Assembly to celebrate women's achievement raise awareness against bias and take action for equality. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, I did not intend to speak at all, Mr uh, Speaker, but I think it is important that these debates are led by women, and, and they were uh, and they have been very uh, strongly today. But being a sole MLA, obviously, I think I have to speak to offer my party support uh, to all the women here and, and everybody on International uh, Women's uh, Day today. Um, Kelly Armstrong, I'm paraphrasing, sort of mentioned that the, the problem isn't in this room. I think we saw previously uh, an MLA uh, signify the problem uh, exactly when women are speaking, uh, they should be listened to, uh, even if there is disagreement. Uh, and talking about uh, men's equality or alluding to that is very, very offensive at any level, but especially. Uh, today, I think that was worth uh, saying. Um, I just wanted to offer my um, 
solidarity to everybody in our communities, all the women uh, who have been working throughout this pandemic as health care workers, as nurses, people in ICU, but also as people have alluded to in current responsibilities as they f- fall overwhelmingly on the shoulders uh, of women. Uh, women have always been at the forefront you don't need me to <laughs> of struggle to change the world and fighting for a, for a better world. And even the origins of International Women's Day comes from radical women, uh, socialist uh, women, feminist, radical feminist women uh, fighting to change the world. And that's the origins of International Women's Day. And I think it's worth just remembering that uh, today. So I just want to offer my support uh, for the motion and solidarity to everybody uh, here and, and uh, beyond on International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Trevor Lund. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I welcome this motion today. I notice it's, it's proposed by uh, six female members. Uh, I, it, it could have been more gender balanced than that, actually, if you'd asked, you know. But there we are. I don't blame you for that. Women's caucus. Women's caucus, yeah. Well, the, well, the, the other members mentioned the, the genesis of the Women's Caucus, and it came through the Speaker's reference group, which Stephen and I, and I were on. But we've kind of faded out of the process after that. Look, that's all, by the way. Um, I want to wish everybody, as everybody else has, a very happy International Women's Day. And that includes the men as well, Mr. Speaker, because we're just as entitled to have a happy day as the women are. So, and if our women are happy, we probably will be too. <laughs> the, um, I was a member of the AERC when this uh, motion came, came up. Uh, Paula referred to it earlier on. And, um, uh, you know, modesty, my natural modesty prevents me from saying which member it was who actually proposed that we discuss this topic at the committee. But let's just say it was me. <laughs> and uh, I, I was actually prompted at that time by a member who has been mentioned several times here today, and that's a very good friend of mine who became a friend through this assembly, and that's Katrina Ruan. Katrina dropped a hint to me at that time that she'd like to do this do this investigation, uh, inquiry, whatever the word is. Uh, I think our our feeling was, in in the atmosphere of the time, that probably if she proposed it, it wouldn't be accepted by the committee. But if somebody like me proposed it, possibly it would. And the committee, to their credit, accepted it quite readily. But at that time, um, there definitely was a need for this sort of discussion to take place. I mean, this, this place, the, the transformation of this place in my time here, was started in 2007, has been quite dramatic. That doesn't mean we've got there yet, but the changes are there for all to see. At that time, we had very poor female representation. It was a male-dominated environment in spades. Uh, people who mentioned on social hours, it wasn't family-friendly. Childcare was non-existent, still isn't. Uh, evidence. Yeah, we, we, got, we took evidence from a number of people, mostly experts in their particular field. But one of them, the one that impressed me at the time, was actually Jane Morris, who was a previously a deputy speaker of this assembly and uh, one of the two women's coalition members at the time, along with Monica McWilliams. And her words stuck with me. I just looked them up there today. She, she referred to incessant attempts to demean, humiliate, and treat with disdain. And that was the attitude of men towards women. And that, you know, that, that was actually true. She wasn't exaggerating. The, the, the treatment that the Women's Coalition members got in this place just before my time was disgraceful. But it's, it's, we've, we've learned from that. We've moved on. As far as the um, various recommendations are concerned, most people have referred to them. I wonder if any of the recommendations, but it was about 30 of them, coming from that committee. Had any of them been fully activated? I don't think so. There's been a bit of lip service paid to some of them, but the ones that would have mattered and made a big difference haven't happened yet. The, uh, I'll not go through the list, but the, you know, the, the need to balance caring responsibilities with the political career, that's, that's a big one. It hasn't been addressed. I want to touch on the representation situation here because it makes sad reading, frankly, for some. Um, I'm not trying to be unkind to anybody here. It may, may sound like up. I don't really want to. But it is a fact. There's, there's 38 unionist MLAs on this side of the House. Seven of them are women. Seven out of 38. Rosemary, you're, you're one out of 10. So it's six in the DUP. This is, 
the other parties can give themselves a bit of a pat on the back here because you've done well. But, but we're not there. We're not there yet. We still have a long way to go, Mr. Speaker. But progress has been made. It's a glass one third full rather than two thirds empty, I think. And uh, I would I would urge the Women's Caucus to continue, keep the pressure on, make make the men listen, make this assembly listen to the message you have, because it's very valid. And you will find, in my experience, there's plenty of men about this place who would agree with you and want to see change. We're not all misogynist pigs. It's, it's a fact. Plenty. The majority of the men in this place now, I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, but now they would support you. So I want you to keep at it. And finally, mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I know I'm just slightly over my time, but let me just say that I'll be retiring here next, next, next May. Um, and then my contribution to the, this process, I think, will be to be replaced by a much younger female representation. I'll leave it at that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good luck to all of you. And uh, I thank the member for that. And uh, I call Ro Claire Sogan is not in the room. We had her down as in Starley, but she's not on the audience. So I move then to uh, Rosemary Barton to wind and conclude this debate. And Rosemary has 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And also, can I wish you all a very happy International Women's Day? Thank you. And I'd like to thank everybody here today for taking part in this, participating in this debate. It has been a very interesting and a wide-ranging debate with very many comments that I wish to consider. And I'd like to make a start and uh, look at what Ms Bailey said. She talked about the, about the purpose of the Women's Caucus and spoke of the parity of esteem for women and we must have adequate actions taken to prevent the marginalisation of women, particularly in politics. Political representation, she said, must reflect the population, and there needs to be, more, there needs to be representation here. It needs to be up to 50%. It is about approximately 33% at the moment. So a gender-sensitive assembly results in legislation that is being put into legislation needs to be outward looking. That's the important, I think, the most important part of, our, of your speech today. It needs to be outward looking. Paula Bradley, Ms. Bradley referred to strong women who had stood in this chamber. She referred to women in the past that stood in this chamber. She also referred to the importance of women in society. And she spoke about what we have been all through recently, working through COVID and keeping our homes together. And it, it hasn't been easy for those that have maybe lost their employment, families off school. So the women have played a crucial role there. Women MLAs should, she also then spoke about the abuse that women MLAs take. And women should not have to, not have to have this to deal with. She spoke about looking at um, about the issues regarding pregnancy and being an MLA in the fact that there is no such thing as maternity leave. Ms Sheeran, she spoke about the importance of the period products and also women that were affected by COVID and the majority of women that were affected by COVID in relation to being furloughed as a result of COVID. These were women, not men. Most majority of people furloughed were women, and many of the unpaid economy, the, the women that are affected, uh, unpaid people in our economy are women. They're the ones that stay at home. They're the ones that look after the house. And she also suggested perhaps that we should use gender quotas and uh, perhaps have mandatory childcare for politicians. And again, we need to, we need to tackle gender based violence. That's very, very important. Sinead, Ms. Ms. Bradley, reminded us of last year and the number of young people that were in that, this chamber this, time, this day last year. And I, I actually was thinking of the same when I came into it today. And she spoke about the difficulties of retaining women in politics. And I think 
We have seen through the years the, the difficulties many parties have had in keeping women once they perhaps have families and caring responsibilities. She referred to the cost of childcare for women and how it prevents women going out to work. And she challenged a lack of understanding for assisting women around the menopause. Uh, Mike Nesbitt and gentlemen, can I just say, you three gentlemen are very welcome to be with us today too. Uh, Mr Nesbitt, he spoke of his international experience of working with international politicians and surprise, surprise, we all have the same issues. And uh, he also spoke in relation to the, D the Dame Deira Parker uh, programme that the Ulster Unionist Party had. And indeed, it was, a, it was a success. may not seem as I'm the only Ulster Unionist here today, but it was, a, it was a success a couple of years ago because we had Joanne Dobson, Sandra Over and Jenny Palmer. And I know a number of them came up through that Dame Deira Parker programme, as I did myself. I attended it also. So um, it was a success. Then he, Mr Nesbitt also spoke about he spoke about the representation of people with disabilities, and I think that's something as an assembly we need to look at, particularly women with disabilities. Uh, Ms. Armstrong, she spoke about the Women's Caucus and bringing a motion in the, that the Women's Caucus should perhaps look at bringing more, more motions in their own right. She spoke about the gender, gender sensitive parliament. It needs to have an environment where both men and women are equally valued, and there is equality for both. She asked for standing orders to be updated, particularly for paternity and maternity leave. And uh, Ms. Ms. Armstrong also referred to inclusive language. She was concerned about the language sometimes used, so she talked about inclusive language, and she spoke about the issues with social media for women. Uh, Mr. Sheeran, he spoke about female underrepresentation in the Assembly and young women starting work today, that they are, will be much less well off at the end of their career than men will be over, the lifetime, over their lifetime. And he praised the females in the chamber who participate. And indeed, he praised them for the late night sittings, for staying late into the night for the sittings and how it impinged on their family life. And he talked about, again, issues of childcare and, and caring responsibilities. And of course, he referred to the misnogic abuse that women have had. Ms. Dolan, she, she also said that women needed to be respected and appreciated, not on one day of the year, but every day. And she referred again to quotas for increasing women's representation and exploring the work-life balances and strategies that we need. And she talked about a third of women working, a third of the women are economically inactive. Ms Hunter referred to women in, she also referred to, we still need more women in politics. She talked about the Queen's, Queen's University Students Union now being all female, and she was optimistic that perhaps this was the start of these ladies moving up and perhaps into the political life and into other lives. Women should not be defined by what they wear and what they look like. She referred to that also. Miss Woods, she spoke about um, sexist remarks that were made to ladies. And again, you also referred to what women looked like, what they wore, and the comments that were often made. You spoke about the difficulties of struggling childcare and uh, childcare and work. And uh, Jerry, Mr. Carroll, he offered his solidarity to the women today speaking and to the women that have particularly been affected over the past year or so um, in relation to COVID. And Mr. Lum, he referred to, he referred again to 2007 when there were very, very poor female representation here in Stormont. And he talked about a number of 30 recommendations that were put forward by, an, by um, a review that took place, and still a number of these have not been implemented. Okay. And um, just I'd like to move on, just make a few 
few comments, if I can. Um, there is no doubt underrepresentation of women in political life in Northern Ireland is a problem. Comments to address these have fallen short, 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 and we know that repeated scrutiny of this failure has come up with the same conclusion, that this is a serious matter and must be addressed with urgency. We have the Belfast Agreement to look at and all its implementation arguments, which make commitments to increase women's representation in public and political life in Northern Ireland. We must make good on these commitments. We cannot continue to deprioritise de or to move slowly on these commitments. The time is now, the time is today to make this endorsement and champion those targeted and strategic inventions set out in the action plan. This motion calls for the Assembly's endorsement of the Women's Caucus Action Plan to implement measures to create a gender-sensitive Assembly. This action plan is grounded in research around gender equality here in Northern Ireland. The Assembly Executive Review Committee made these recommendations after its comprehensive audit and resulting in-depth report, Women in Politics in Northern Ireland. This Assembly has been scrutinised and has been deemed not good enough, an institution that is a place which facilitates and promotes participation and inclusion for women. We know that if you don't have adequate representation of women in positions of decision-making and leadership, then you do not have an Assembly that legislates at the level of gender sensitivity that it should be legislating at an assembly that is less effective than it could be, one that is less democratic than it could be. We know that women's equal participation in political processes result in tangible gains for everyone, for the legitimacy of Parliament, for the quality of the analysis and solutions that are brought forward to create legislative change. The Women's Caucus recognises this, and today we have brought it to the assembly we, to reiterate the considerable amount of work that remains to be undertaken. This action plan serves to create a gender-sensitive Northern Ireland Assembly, one that is founded on the principle of gender equality, so that both men and women can access their equal right to participate without discrimination. I call on this Assembly to endorse the recommendations in the Gender Sensitive Assembly Action Plan put forward today by the Northern Ireland Women's Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Pat Shagan, Swissman, over to me there. You have broke me today uh, in terms of the time. But anyway, um, the question is, is the motion standing on the order paper be agreed? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The, the ayes have it. Could I thank everybody for their contributions? in this debate this afternoon. I think it's a very worthwhile and important debate, and uh, I think the contributions are really significant co uh, quality and content. Could I also thank those members who have taken part in the initiative from the Speaker's Office, which included a number of uh, videos which are broadcast today on the Assembly website. As many of you will know, the, the women here who have participated in that, um, I'd like to thank the Assembly, the Speaker's Office staff, and the qualms team for putting together the videos. I think we'll have something like 17 videos in total published today, or broadcast today, I should say, on the website. And those range from, uh, obviously, a number of MLAs, people from public office, including our own Leslie Hogg, here's clerk, chief executive, Brenda King, attorney general. We've also a range of sportswomen uh, on the videos. We have disability campaigners and uh, academics. So I would commend people to also try and log in uh, to their website and to look and listen to some of the very, very inspiring stories from some very remarkable people out in our community, which is only really a really drop in the ocean of the, uh, the, the talent and the ability that we have out there and across our society, but particularly on this day of International Women's Day. So I'd also like to have my own solidarity all those women who are stalwarts in our communities, our families, our friends, our loved ones, people who we can uh, 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 look, at, look up to with um, admiration, to say the least. So I want to thank everybody for their contribution today. And 
The next item on the agenda is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Thank you.